from different parts of the world. Welcome to this event where we're going to be launching the publication entitled Voices of Rural and Indigenous Women, Recommendations on Dealing with Climate Safety Issues. For us, it is also a pleasure to welcome our panelists, um, whom I will later have the honor of introducing. I would like to start by introducing myself. My name is Cristina Hoyos, and I am the head for Latin America and the Caribbean for TCAP, which is the Center for Governance for the Security Sector. For us, it is an honor to have the possibility to share with you the results from our investigation, which is an input, or which we hope to be an input, to the discussion about the impacts of the uh, climate crisis around uh, human safety for women. I would like before anything, to start with some housekeeping rules, uh, with some housekeeping information, really, so we're all on the same page. Uh, first of all, this session will be recorded and uh, published at a later date, so you can share it um, by YouTube. Um, and if you are interested, then, of course, we'll, we'll be quite interested in you sharing it. We also have simultaneous English interpretation and uh, you can choose uh, the necessary audio channel for the language that you would like. TCAFLAC is doing a great effort to be able to interpret and translate all its events and publications into English. So the information that we generate in the region can truly reach a wider audience. That is uh, what we're trying to do. Also, um, just as a comment, uh, our publication, which is both in English and Spanish, will also be shared with you at the end of the event, so you can also disseminate it with the people who you think might be interested in reading it. Furthermore, we at the end, we're going to have a Q&A session in case there's any comments or questions you would like to ask the panelists, so please feel free to do so. And that way we can facilitate a broader dialogue and have a larger discussion about this issue, which we think is of, of absolute importance. Now, to introduce the work that we do at DCAP, let me just say that it's been over five years that we've been working in Latin America and the Caribbean, especially around governance for the security sector. DCAB is located in Geneva, and uh, we're basically supporting uh, different states, uh, the civil society and congresses to improve uh, the governance of the security sector, to achieve more transparency and to have better accountability mechanisms. In Latin America, we are working in Colombia, specifically with the national police, not only around the issue of climate change, uh, which is um, the gist of our work, but we're also working with gender issues. Uh, we're also working with a very sensitive topic, which is a use of force. And also with the Colombian Congress, we've been doing very interesting work around legislative control because we understand uh, the reform of the security sector from a broader aspect, if you will. We're also working with the media and with the police in different aspects to have a better understanding among the media and uh, police members in issues that are of um, high sensitivity, as well as with the protests that are happening in Colombia. We also have an office in Honduras where we're working around the trust and confidence, uh, community policing, uh, use of force, uh, mentoring, gender. And in Chile, we're working with the Carabineros in crowd control. The issue of climate change is becoming, for TCAV, one of the most important areas, especially uh, being aware of the um, challenges in Latin America and the Caribbean. Therefore, we think it's extremely important to see how we can work in climate change around the governance of the security sector and around the issue of human security and safety. With this publication, what we're trying to do is 
starting to understand how to build indicators to measure the impact of climate change in indigenous women in Colombia. And I'm very happy to have had the opportunity to participate in this study with the work that we've been doing with Elvira and with indigenous and rural women in Segundoy at the Colombian Putumayo. This is one of the first works that we're doing at the operational level in TCAF, and we are also very happy to mention that uh, throughout the region, we are releasing many videos uh, from the other countries uh, that are a part of the Amazon Treaty, where we're analyzing what are the needs of access to safety, what are the ideas behind how to do better work with the security sector in the Amazon on. And uh, we're also about to start some work in Brazil, in Roraima, to have a better understanding of what are the links that we could encounter there. So that's just like in the nutshell, um, my introduction. Now I would like to hand over the mic to Mark Downs. He is uh, the subdirector at DCAV and he is the head of operations at DCAV. And uh, since we are talking about videos, this, uh, or Mark Downs, um, will join us by video. So Linda, please play Mark video, Mark's video now and thank you. Good morning, everyone. Depending on where you are in the world, good evening. My name is Mark Downs, and I'm Deputy Director and Head of Operations at DCAF, the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance. We at DCAF are dedicated to uh, improving the security of states and individuals, and we do this by supporting effective and accountable security and justice provision within the framework of democratic governance, the rule of law, and human rights. We're delighted to be part of this launch today of this very important publication. It focuses on ensuring the development of gender indicators uh, within the context of climate change. Climate change has had a devastating, differential, and gendered consequence on human security. It is clear, therefore, that effective and accountable security actors have a key role to play in addressing the challenges and ensuring that security is provided equitably to all in society. Indigenous and rural women specifically are disproportionately affected by climate-related security issues. Acknowledging and measuring the impact of the climate crisis on their security can aid local interventions and ensure more effective programming. Given the central role that the security sector plays in addressing the climate crisis, ensuring responsiveness can contribute to the delivery of both gender and climate sensitive security. DCAF's engagement in the Latin America and Caribbean region aims to strengthen citizen security by supporting police forces, parliaments and civil society capacity. And we're working with partners in a number of countries in the region on these issues. The publication which is being launched today is a result of a joint collaboration between DCAF and the Colombian NGO Ambiente Sociedad, who engaged indigenous and rural women as well as active and serving police officers to collect their insights into how security is conceived in the era of climate change. The publication aims to contribute to this effort by providing both valuable but also actionable recommendations for the development of local context-specific indicators to measure the impact of the climate crisis on different dimensions of women's security. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all the panelists today who've given their time and will share their perspectives on this publication. And they will discuss two key issues, the first of which is the role of security sector governance, SSG, in addressing the climate emergency, and secondly, how climate sensitive security interventions could benefit from both ancestral and gender perspectives. I'd like to welcome all of you attending from around the world and for your support and interest in this important topic. In closing, I'd like to make an offer on behalf of DCAF to those of you who are engaged in 
the security sector governance and reform in your countries around the region, that we are here to provide and support your efforts to make a more effective and accountable security sector that meets the needs of all in society. And so if you are interested in ensuring a gender and climate sensitive security sector, we're here to provide whatever assistance we can, either through technical assistance, through launching publications such as the one we have today, through trainings or capacity development. With that, let me uh, wish you a good discussion, an interesting debate, and I look forward to us all putting into action these indicators and ensuring a gendered approach to security sector governance. Thank you. Thank you very much for that video, Linda, where Mark Downs, our Deputy Director, um, basically made the official inauguration for this event. Now, I would also like to invite uh, Natalia Lopez Ortiz, the Senior Officer for Political Affairs for the Embassy of the Bay Bar in Bogota, to speak. She will address the audience today. And um, we also thank the support of the Bay Bar because um, they, they were a paramount for this publication. So, Natalia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you, Christina. And good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting us to participate. On behalf of our embassy in Colombia, I want to thank you. Um, well, um, in our embassy, uh, we've been thoroughly involved in uh, peace building and human rights for many years. And we have been spearheading many events ever since the uh, signing of the peace accord to build this common dream. And we're doing so by following a policy from the Ministry of Foreign Relationships in, um, in, in Holland, uh, whose priority is equality for women and uh, girls under various um, fo uh, focus around peace building we're doing important work around um women in the um, 360 resolution in how women can um chip into peace building efforts in the country we also have the issue of access to land and this is the work that we're doing with a rural woman and in all of the work that we do we also include ethnical focuses and territorial focuses by understanding that one thing is to speak about rural women but quite another thing is to speak about women who live in urban cities who have a different role maybe and then there's also the issue of climate change which is a red flag for everyone and it is an issue with which we've been working in the country for a long time we are supporting colombia not only through a political focus but also through the economic sector through different initiatives because like many others have said before me climate change obviously affects the security of our humans the development of our countries it affects women disproportionately it affects rural women especially but also you know uh, farmer women and also city women those of us who receive the food that is being harvested in the towns and if you know, women in rural areas can't produce food then women in urban cities can't uh, receive the goods um, food should be accessible it should um, have the right price and that is why as part of the international community this is a red flag for us it's something that we're constantly looking into and trying to deal into this issue with a very comprehensive focus a focus that should understands that the affectations of climate change are enormous and that they affect almost all the aspects in our lives around our peace building efforts around our human rights policy work and rural development actions that is why we are permanently working in seeking partners around all sectors and that's why i enjoy events such as these where we have uh, the police and uh, the unipep which is a unit whom we've been supporting ever since its inception i am very happy that they're with us today 
This is why in every sort of partnership, we insist that we have to work together with um, state institutions, with the civil society, with international cooperation. So among us all, we're able to find how to better deal with this problem so that among us all, we're able to understand the ways in which climate change is truly affecting women all around. And that way, we can build policies and as part of the international community, we can support these policies. So, I want to congratulate ECAV for the report they're going to introduce for us today. I'm very, very anxious to hear about it, actually. I'm here more to listen than to speak, really. I'm here to learn, so thank you. No, thank you, Natalia, for your words. I think that you've said a key thing, which is partnerships are important. And not only partnerships with the international cooperation, um, also the police, the state institutions, and for this very complex work, uh, which includes uh, climate change, we must also include not only security specialists, but also those who focus on human security, which is up the utmost interest to us. I think this partnership can help us seek the solutions that we're searching out for this very complex issue, for this nexus that we are trying to find, you know. So thank you, Natalia. And now we'd like to hear from Abby Robinson. She is our advisor in DCAP and she is a leader for the uh, project under which framework this publication is being launched today. I think that Abby played a very important role because uh, she is in charge not only of of this project, but also many other projects uh, um, around the uh, security, uh, the issue of hybrid security, use of force, and many other topics that we think are of the utmost importance. So now I'd like us to hear from Abby so she can reflect about this, because this area of climate change and its links to the governance of the security sector is an issue that she's very interested in. So thank you very much, Abby. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christina, and good afternoon, everyone. It is really both a, a pleasure and an honor to be able to help open this afternoon's event. Uh, as Christina mentioned, the research we'll be discussing today is part of a broader project I manage, um, the aim of which is to reflect on what works and what does not work in improving security sector governance, and also to explore new approaches to security sector governance which strengthen the ability of security institutions to really provide more effective and responsive security to communities. And it's important to see the publication we're discussing today in that light. The strategic context in which we provide security is changing. I think this is always true, but especially now as we face the climate and health crises and really understand the extent to which our security as humans is inextricably linked with that of the environment on which we depend. This is, of course, a significant challenge, but it's also an opportunity for us to think differently about which factors will make us safer and more secure in an era which is shaped by climate change. And I think that's really how the team has approached this study. And perhaps most importantly, our focus on indicators, which Linda is going to tell you more about in a few minutes, has not been to simply provide a more accurate way of measuring what is indeed an already concerning situation, but to offer concrete entry points for communities, government institutions, and their international partners to work together at the intersection of environmental and human security. And while the specific context is obviously unique to Colombia, we hope that many aspects of both the methodological approach and the results are going to be relevant to partners in other countries and other regions which are facing similar concerns. The study is part of a growing body of work here at DCAF, which is focused on identifying opportunities for security sector governance and for the security sector more broadly to mitigate the risks which are posed by climate change and environmental degradation and even to address factors to drive, which are driving climate change to begin with. Finally, I'd like to echo Mark in thanking our partners in Colombia, our panelists, and everyone who has contributed to this research. And I'd especially like to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands for supporting this work and for giving us this opportunity to explore new ways of understanding people-centered security. Thank you. 
No, muchas gracias, Abby, por estas palabras, porque yo creo que tú... Thank you very much for those words, Abby. I think that you are hitting on some very important uh, issues. It is important for us to have a document that gives us maybe the steps to follow so we can uh, make um, our steps more operational. And the climate crisis, like you said, isn't something that affects Colombia only. I hope that this study, that this report can help the rest of the country and can give us tips and how we can apply it in other contexts. This document that we will be introducing today is the first that we are presenting through TCAP involving a field research. We believe that this is a topic that will be extremely important, not only currently, but also in the future. And that's precisely why we're so interested in working around this issue. So thank you very much, Abby. And also thank you for your support in the creation of this investigation, which has been so important. Now, I would finally like to present the video which was prepared within the context of a, a support from the Swiss government. Uh, we um, have, are doing eight videos so we can get the perspective of the people who are living in the Amazon to see what are their needs and how they understand the issue of climate change and how it's directly affecting them during their daily life. So thank you very much. Now, Linda, if you could please introduce the video uh, where we are interviewing Elvira, who is with us here today as well. Please go ahead. ¿Cómo es que la seguridad afecta? The Amazonian foothills are home to 36 indigenous peoples, including the Kamsa, a community to which Elvira Josa belongs. Soy Luz Elvira Josa, soy del departamento del Putumayo, soy víctima del desplazamiento forzado y pues actualmente estoy viviendo en Sibundó y Putumayo. Luz Elvira is a mother, leader and indigenous woman. She directs an organization for women who seek collective work as a mechanism to stay united and safe. Somos desplazadas todas con nuestros hijos, madres, cabezas de familia y trabajamos colectivamente y estamos unidas allí como para susanar el dolor y apoyarnos de la una a la otra. Part of the work of indigenous women in their communities focuses on food production and the care of the chagras, which are their local orchards. For hundreds of years, these communities have maintained their ancestral practices and knowledge, but climate change and pollution are directly affecting the food systems of these communities. La producción de los productos agrícolas eran muchos más sanos y crecían con más rapidez, con más entusiasmo. Eh, teníamos mejores productos. Ahora, si los productos salen, salen ya toca funigarlos y si no, no. Entonces toca tener como más cuidado. En la parte de la seguridad alimentaria, pues está terminando. Ya, ya si nosotras en, en, intentamos construir, porque uno siempre debe hacer incidencia a la no contaminación y a traer nuestras semillas nativas, a seguir nuevamente con lo que teníamos antes. Extreme environmental changes and the use of herbicides have caused some species and water sources to disappear. Si nosotros miramos una de nuestras preocupaciones tan grandes donde había humedales, pues ya no los hay, se han acabado los humedales, ya no hay las aves que estaban, ya no están los pajaritos, ya no están muchos eh, mosquitos que los existían, se están muriendo, porque hoy en día se está usando los monocultivos, la fumigación, todo eso ha hecho que haya destruido al medio ambiente y se vaya contaminando. Communities such as Elvira's have committed to preserving and protecting the environment through actions such as planting native seeds and reducing the use of plastic. But this activism is currently at risk. Si nosotros hablamos de seguridad, pues es la parte que no me gusta tocarla porque en primer lugar, pues es primero protegernos nosotras, ¿no es cierto? Y proteger hacia los demás. The perception of risk is indicative of the need to strengthen the levels of trust that these communities have in the authorities. Pero a la larga, como líderes y lideresas, estamos pues un poquito más la mujer de riesgo, pero sí tenemos riesgos los hombres y las mujeres, y los ancianos también. Putumayo is a region that faces challenges such as difficulty in accessing communities and internal armed conflict. 
Nonetheless, Elvira's organization takes actions to protect natural resources such as water, sows native seeds and trees, and avoids logging. Cuando tú eres líder y estás liderando algo, pues siempre tienes un riesgo, ¿no? Having support from authorities and institutions can increase the effectiveness and sustainability of these actions. For Elvira, unity is a factor that brings hope to face the environmental and security threats that Amazon communities are currently experiencing. Invitarlos también a los jóvenes de Suiza, que debemos siempre ir uniendo jóvenes, que nos unamos todos, la unión hace la fuerza, que si todos aportamos un granito de arena, de verdad que tal vez nuestro mundo y nuestras aguas volverían a ser las mismas. Thank you very much for that. I believe this video summarizes the situation that Elvira and her communities are going through. This is what uh, rural women and men are going through. And uh, we have many more videos like this, not only from Colombia, but also other countries like Ecuador and Brazil. And we're finishing uh, these video series that we're going to use to raise awareness about this issue at the international level. Now, I think that uh, there are many other comments that I should make here. First of all, uh, this publication that we're launching here today is a part of an effort uh, from a joint result between DCAV and also the civil and the environmental societies, whom we thank for their technical and methodological support. It's been paramount, really. And also, um, the knowledge that was brought to the table was immeasurable. Also, uh, I want to thank uh, the um, connection with the communities in Segundoy, especially El through Elvira. Uh, with this project, we also analyze a series of tools and um, instruments that currently exist to measure the impact of climate change in women and to what point these instruments could be adjusted or not to the reality of rural and indigenous women in the High Putumayo. I think that beyond providing recommendations, uh, which we've obtained not only at the level of the community from the international communities and from the police for the creation of local indicators, this publication also offers recommendations that precisely spring from this intersection between gender and climate security. This to uh, deal more comprehensively with the dimension of human safety for women. Now I would like to hand over the mic to Linda Sanchez. She is the author of this study and she's been working intensely on it during the last couple of months to be able to hold this launch jointly with all of our societies and our DCAV team. Linda is a project officer for DCAV and she has a doctorate, a PhD in uh, humanitarian studies and conflict response. She has over 15 years of experience not only at the level of research, but also in the implementation of projects. Uh, please, Linda, um, she, she's going to uh, speak a little bit more about the study and uh, not only about its background, but also the methodologic um, details around it and also the results, which will be the basic basis for the discussion that we'll have afterwards. So, Linda, the floor is yours. Previously, there was a more organized population and they got the, uh, their own produce and they wrapped their own uh, crops and they also um, had their own practices. Our ancestors, our titans are dying. They're the ones who know, knew about ancestral medicine. The customs of the indigenous communities are dying and now we're handing our children lands that are infertile. If you have a lot of land, but if it doesn't help for anything, it's like having nothing. Mother Earth is dead. I have been quoting some uh, phrases from rural indigenous women uh, during our investigation. When we asked these women what were the effects of climate change in their territories, that's what they answered. For those who don't know about the Putumayo, it is located in the Amazon in Colombia, and it is an area of high importance 
and diversity where various uh, colonies um, live, where there is some armed conflict, but where there are a lot of rural indigenous communities thriving there. Besides um, the security factors that are focused on, the, on crime, insecurity is basically a gender issue which is interconnected and which happens at different levels in the area. I am going to share with you now uh, my presentation. Just let me know once you can see it on screen, just a moment. There we are. Oh. Sorry, technical issues. There we are, much better. Now, the analysis of the imperfection to which uh, Christine, or the intersection that Christina mentioned between climate change, gender, and security is an intersection of early exploration. While there are studies that have looked into climate change from um, from a security standpoint, gender is something that tends to be analyzed by its own quite differently. Same thing happens with gender studies, which don't always integrate the climate perspective into their studies. It is clear from the quotes of the women that I just shared with you that not everybody suffers the effects of this crisis the same way. Neither do they have the same access to security. And why does this happen? Because during a, cri a climate crisis like this, and we don't all have the same access, the same use, or the same control over natural resources. Neither do we have the same expectations. Uh, for the women of Sigundoy, security looks differently. For them, security looks like sustainable uh, food. Um, and uh, um, the preservation of their ancestral practices, uh, of their community leaderships, uh, of having access to justice. It also looks like the elimination of sex and gender-based violence. It includes having clean water, includes having constant electricity, and above all, access uh, to economic security through financial products. The literature tells us that uh, due to social and historical roles, women, uh, rural and indigenous women are mainly affected by um, climate change. But how can we measure that? How to measure the impact of climate change with these women? We took to the task of, together with our investigation team, reviewing four sets of, of indicators or four sets of databases that exist. One of them is the um, climate change program from the uh, UN and the international program for um, climate change. We also looked into the index of women, peace and security, and we also looked into the prevalence of the triple nexus, which refers to um, state security, climate vulnerability and inequality in gender issues. Um, now, these um, groups of indicators that you see on the screen are global. They can let us see internationally what is happening, but these indicators can't reflect the different expressions and interpretations of the security that I've just mentioned. Uh, for instance, the prevalence of the triple nexus does not consider community experiences. Neither does it consider the access of women uh, that, that women have to financial act, uh, services, which is fundamental to understand the experiences of women who live in territories like Sikundoy or other similar environs. The elements that are related to the security that I just mentioned are strongly related to the way in which women see their own lives and their own territories in Sikundoy. The idea that we had was to link women, of course, but also the security sector. And how did we go about it? In this investigation, we had a fundamental partner, which was the... Um, um, Ambiente y Sociedad Association, without their support, this investigation would have been impossible. We also worked with 25 women, 80% of which belong to five indigenous groups, Camensa, Quilancinga, Cuastos, Inca, and Nasayins. We also included five environmental female leaders, and we also found seven active police officers, both from the police unit for peace building, as well as the direction, directorate of Carabineros and rural security. Now, women did an assessment to look at these indicators to see how much they truly reflected their experience in their territories. And 
With the participation of the police, we were able to identify areas where the data around these indicators could be more operational or actionable, really within, of course, the framework of uh, security sector governance. We did this uh, through uh, two lenses, the ecofeminist lens and the e lens for the dimensions of human safety, to truly being able to see the complexity within this territory. Now, from the study that we're introducing you to uh, you today, I want you to have three main takeaways. The first main takeaway is the idea that human safety and the environment should be understood as being inherently intertwined. The second takeaway is that security goes beyond the traditional conceptions linked to crime, homicide, and um, delinquency. And the third takeaway that I would like you to keep in mind after this presentation or after reading our publication is that it is necessary and extremely important to measure the impact of the climate crisis in the safety of women. Now I'm going to focus on the first idea, the first takeaway. Human security should be understood as an element that is intertwined, that is very deeply linked to environmental issues. We must understand that fundamentally we are eco-dependent beings. This means that we depend on our natural resources. Human safety cannot be understood as something separate from the capacity that the planet has to sustain um, ecosystems that are interrelated to us. This relationship is very strong in rural and indigenous communities who depend on subsistence economies, who depend on ancestral practices, men, women, and uh, people with non-binary gender identities don't have the same expectations or the same levels of access to resources, to justice, and above all, to decision-making opportunities. Our investigation found that in terms of environmental security, the first affectation for women in Sikundoi are floods and landslides. This harm their crops, their food safety, and it also makes people uh, feel forced to, um, to displace. Uh, food safety is also affected when they lose their traditional plants. In terms of um, in economic terms, of course, when they have damages to their lands and they lose their crops and they don't have access to financial products like safe credits. And there's also a high level of migration led by men who migrate from their lands to try to find work. One of the main economic activities there are illicit crops. There is also a pay inequality. Women who work as day laborers don't get the same amount of money as men get, and this creates an even larger gap. Besides, there is also an increase in immigrants, both economic migrants who come from elsewhere trying to seek out a better work, but also um, due to the crisis happening in Venezuela, because there are migrants coming in, and when the subpopulation goes up, then resources become scarce. There is more pressure to provide more resources to more people. In terms of personal and community safety, it's clear, as Elvira said in her video, that uh, the threats and the intimidation that female community leaders are getting is quite evident. There is also an increase in sexual and domestic violence. But we also found that when men migrate, normally there is some relief at homes because perpetrators of that violence are no longer at home. So, you know, we found a certain nuanced ideas around the issue of sexual violence. When we spoke with women, we have uh, stories about uh, the, how their kids stay at home alone or how they're more vulnerable to security issues. Well, we didn't found that there is a direct dispute um, between people around their natural resources. There are tensions in communities to access to these natural resources, especially because there is a perception perception that environmental licenses are given to external uh, stakeholders and not to people living within the community. The climate crisis, as you can see, multiplies and exacerbates the vulnerabilities around these women. 
And that is why it's important to understand that all sectors have an important role to fulfill, including the security sector. While it's while it's clear that the majority of uh, people in poverty are women, indigenous women are especially vulnerable since they depend on subsistence economies and on natural resources. Now, the second takeaway, the second idea I wanted to speak of, of is related precisely to the perception of women which goes beyond our traditional definitions. Like I previously said, uh, this relates to other elements such as land ownership, um, gender, sexual uh, based violence, um, also the preservation of ancestral practices and also community leaderships. For us, it was extremely important, interesting to see that the vision of police officers and women isn't uh, completely uh, different. They actually have very similar visions of what's happening in the territory and all dimensions of human safety for these women are affected by it. And given the effects of uh, climate crisis uh, generate larger pressures to them than COVID-19. For women, it is more important to see what's happening around uh, them climate-wise than what's happening with the pandemic. Now, in terms of food safety, of course, um, um, there are damages to their subsistence crops, to their native seeds, to their traditional medicine, and uh, the fumigation of illicit crops have also brought about health issues. There's malnutrition, there's water contamination. In terms of political security, as I said, um, there's a perception of injustice. There exists injustice due to the fact that environmental licenses are given only to external stakeholders. And there is a perception that women have uh, when facing their security sectors. The police and uh, the military personnel are seen uh, very differently there. The military personnel, since they have a more direct access during disaster relief, well, they have a more positive perception than the police does. And this is because uh, the police can't really get to all of the territories yet, but also there are certain entry points that are still to be identified, which is something the police is currently doing, so they can reach the furthermost communities where the indigenous communities truly reside. In terms of health, women mentioned that they felt frustrated and uh, there was some anxiety for them. They have to go further to find water now, and there are also many health issues related to the herbicides being used around them. While we can't say that um, all of this is due to climate change, all of the security areas are interconnected and effects are being generated in other security dimensions. The third takeaway I want to share with you today is that it's extremely necessary and important to measure the impact of the climate crisis on women, and on this is where our publication centers. We need local indicators. One of the main challenges with climate change is measuring or scaling these effects because there is no truly unique baseline that will tell us what are the effects in the ecosystems and in all of these segments in society. Even so, for women, it wasn't always easy to identify what was part of the climate change and what wasn't because uh, we have historical uh, violent situations and historical uh, violent situ uh, situations around the use of nat around the use of natural resources so it's not easy to pinpoint one specific case now to do so in this project we propose a series of recommendations to changes to the existing tools to be able to truly track these variations and these trends and these things that make security more particular from the indigenous and rural standpoint. In our publication, you're going to find recommendations on each area of security, and you'll find elements related there to the importance of mapping, for instance, ancestral practices and subsistence crops, and also local calendars uh, for, uh, uh, for crop harvesting, uh, the access to financial 
um, to financial benefits, um, the access to the use of the resources, and many other environmental um, issues that are being challenged, and not only in Colombia, but also in all of Latin America. The evidence compiled by all of these indicators can back up decision making, and it can help the security sector prioritize and focus their actions. The security sector in Colombia is unique in the fact that it is delving into environmental issues and uh, doing so from a peacekeeping standpoint. It can also be an entry point to consolidate the dialogue among the institutions and the ownership of um, climate response plans. The dialogue among communities is very important because upon it, legitimacy for each of the institutions can also be proved. And in conclusion, I wanted to mention three takeaways once again. The first one is uh, for us to be very clear on the basis of the data from this investigation that security is an interconnected experience with the gender dimension, which cannot be uh, understood apart from the issue of natural resources. The second conclusion is that it's necessary to revise and adapt indicators to local contexts to be able to measure and understand the way in which risks affect women and how those risks change through time according to the severity, the frequency and the um, scope thereof. And third, the efforts to prevent and mitigate the effects of the uh, climate crisis are multi-sectorial, where the security sector plays a fundamental role. So, I hope that after this launch, you can have access to the publication, which will be available in Spanish and in English, and which uh, explores the ideas that I've shared with you today. Thank you. Linda, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It has a large amount of important elements for us to focus on. And it not only compiles the recommendations for the security sector, but also recommendations for the international community in general, for the dialogue that we're currently having in Colombia throughout the entire um, peacekeeping context and the implementation of the recommendations are off at a regional level. I think this can be a very important entry point for the security sector to truly understand which could be the contributions that they can have to seek out a better dialogue. And like you said, the analysis from uh, um, from the standpoint of um, indigenous and rural women in the region and the work with the police shows that the gap isn't that large, that there is a lot of headway that can be done and there's a lot of common area, of common ground to tread. But now I would like to hear from our panelists because um, we did spend a lot of time in our introduction, but thank you very much for your presentation, Linda. Uh, for us, uh, we've basically defined uh, two main questions that we're going to ask of the panelists. Uh, first of all, we would like to hear from you to hear what are your general reflections and comments around the publication. We'd like to hear what each of the panelists um, have understood around this. And from the point of view of DCAF, we would like to hear how the recommendations can be implemented. For us, it's very important that these publications um, aren't only shelved, you know, or archived. We want to see how we can truly work jointly. Like Linda said, this is a multi-sectoral topic and it should be worked from different points of view, including um, coordination mechanisms. Therefore, let me hear from the panelists now. I would like to start with um, Luz Elvira. She isn't only a female leader, has been a female leader since she was a child. She's also a coordinator of the association Pensamientos Ancestrales o Corre, which is working for the defense of the territory, the water and the environment. And she provides some support to the Ambiente y Sociedad Association. Elvira is also a public accountant and a psychologist. And we're going to hear from her now. I would like to also introduce the author 
other panelists. Uh, we have with us today Colonel Alexander Castillo Marin, who has some important history with the Colombian National Police. He has over 25 years of experience with the police, and he is spearheading the UNIPEP's efforts. The UNIPEP is the police unit for the edification of peace. We also have uh, Superintendent Carlos Pedros Mosquera, who has over 16 years of experience working with the National Colombian Police. And during his last years, he's uh, been dedicated to the area of uh, ecological and environmental protection, and he will be logging in directly from the Putumayo. I would also like to welcome Dr. Lucas Rutinger, a Delphi uh, from a think tank in Berlin. He is a senior advisor working in Adelphi for over 10 years, and he is working specifically around the interface of environmental policy, the development of external policy um, in the security sector, and he's currently focusing more around the issue of uh, peace, conflict, climate change, and immediate security. So, these are going to be our four panelists of the day. So, I would like us to start hearing from Elvira, so she can answer our questions. So, thank you very much, Elvira. Right. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon for those of you who live in countries where it's already the afternoon. I would really like to thank you. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, Ambiente y Sociedad, because you made this a reality. It's great that organizations actually reach our territories because then you realize uh, the true reality that we're living through. That is a fundamental part for us. So I'm very thankful for that. It's great to know that it's great to know that we're tr that, that we're that we're still alive. That we're still fighting. <laughs> um, I'm not going to take very long with my remarks because. Mercifully, you've already said many important things about uh, what we live in, in our territories with our indigenous communities, uh, as displaced women and as rural and farmer women. This is a challenge that we women have, and it isn't easy, but it's not impossible either, because uh, there's advocacy. While we stand, we'll keep going and we will always stay united. We women will always stick together, no matter the distances that are separating us physically. Our thoughts and our work is aligned and we all think like indigenous farmer women in our territories. We know that we come from a mother, that we are mothers. For us indigenous women, then we care for our true mother earth. Our mother is calling us. She's saying, we want to be with you. We understand the pain that you mothers are feeling because I feel pain. And that makes me feel acceptable, you know. We indigenous women have to be together because truly a mother's suffering isn't easy to bear. We are mothers. We know what suffering is like. And you mothers know when children fail us, what a big blow that is to us. Well, that's a blow that our Mother Earth is feeling. We're failing her. Knowing that we are female leaders in a territory isn't easy because our resources aren't available to us women. There are so many inhabitants, and I'm sorry if I'm crying, but you know, this really makes me feel a little uh, acceptable. As indigenous communities, this is just what we're feeling nowadays, you know, knowing that that Mother Earth is ailing, that, you know, we have uh, snipped away our umbilical cord, that we no longer have the connection with her, that uh, we're no longer feeding from our mother. That, that is hurtful, knowing that we were born from our Mother Earth and that when we die, we return to her, just shows that the connection shouldn't be severed, that it's still there, but that we're failing our mother. All of your reflections today have been really good. You have all presented on very important information and material that really makes me proud because, you know, this 
everything that you've said is truly reflective of what we women are going through in the territory. We know that our authorities may not always help us, but our com but, but they, sometimes they fail us. You know, we don't get all of the aid, we don't get all of the help that we should be getting. And in spiritual issues, for instance, spirituality is running out for us because our mountains are being destroyed, our forests are being decimated. There is no place for us to preserve our spirituality. There are so many things that I could speak of. And, you know, by the way, my time is running out. Just let me know, Linda, because I may be extending myself. Um, there are so many things, you know, that just move you. If, if we know that when we compare with what things looked like before to how they look today, you know, the situation is very sad. Before we were happy, before we had freedom, before we felt like women who felt safe letting their children run in the forests, uh, drinking from a pure water spring. Uh, they had everything they wanted from the Mother Earth. They lived happily beside the animals in the forest, but that's not the case any longer. We can't let our kids run around because it's unsafe. We can't let them drink water from a spring because it's contaminated. We can't let our children run, period. Our uh, brothers, our husbands have to emigrate, they have to leave our lands, our territories, because our lands are no longer productive. There's so much pain all around, nothing is the same. I was hearing your uh, previous interventions and it really moves me to know about the excellent work that you're doing and, you know, this is what we feel. There's so much around security that we can speak of, you know, but, you know, fumigations decimated our land. Uh, they contaminated our lands more than they helped. Our lands are no longer fertile. Think about how many women had to flee their territories. Think about how many had to run away from that violence, from the uh, security concerns, you know, to protect themselves, to protect their health. And we have done nothing about it. These are things that exist, that we see every day, and we are crying for this to be more visible out there. But it's seen as something normal. Leaders, governors see this as a normal thing. Our leaders haven't looked beyond that, beyond how we live in our territories and how, as indigenous women, we are facing more security. No, our leaders are interested in money, in power, and in destroying everything in their path, as long as they're able to get these, without realizing that in their road to find money, they may be trampling on indigenous women who need support, who need education. It's sad to know that from a spiritual standpoint, we're no longer able to find ease of mind and peace. We can't hold our spiritual rights in our forests. We can't find ourselves in nature anymore. So let's reflect about how we are able to truly build a better future for our kids, to truly teach our ancestral practices and spiritualities to them. We can't do it anymore because our forests are decimated. Every day there's new mining companies coming in who um, destroy our resources. It's sad and regrettable to see that the mining companies come in saying that they're protected by the government, saying that uh, uh, the mine is going to be uh, working there and that uh, their illegal activities are going to be upheld by the government. It hurts to know that our government supports them instead of us. When we try to do some mining, we do it only for sustainable issues and we do it very ecologically. But you know, when a multinational company comes in and they set up, they don't do things ecologically and the government vouches for them and they vouch for all of the destruction that they bring about. That hurts. And that's why I entice you all today, both women and men, to join in the defense of our Mother Earth. Let's all remember that it, we're hurting our mother and that all of the mistakes that our children do hurt. We're hurting our mother. We are damaging her. I just, you know, want to invite you to reflect upon that. 
and to find a way for us all to be united in the defense of our mother. From an environmental standpoint, to think about how we can return to, um, to the care of our climate. It's a very difficult situation that we're going through, yes, but it's not impossible. Together, we can truly make some headway. Right, Elvira, thank you, really. Thank you so much for this call for action, shall we say. Your indigenous voice in this context is essential. One of the issues that we wanted to truly remark here is the need for more visibility. It's part of the um, principles of this focus, and it is an entry point to find a dialogue with, commun with indigenous communities in the High Putomayo in Sikundoi. I think this is an extremely important point, and I really thank you for your words. Um, um for your, what for your words in the video for your words now and i really appreciate your call to action really um now i think we can uh, move on to colonel alexander castillo marin so we can um get a little bit uh more of his answer around his perspectives and on the implementation of the recommendations that we've made with this study so colonel thank you very much the floor is yours Right, good morning to each and everyone who is uh, joining us. I would like to give you our greetings uh, from the National Colombian Police, from our Deputy Director Alfredo Pinilla, who is uh, the um, lead for our Special Police Unit for Peacekeeping. I would also like to give a special greeting to all panelists, to Ms. Elvira, to um, Dr. Lucas and the Superintendent Pedrosa. I want to echo uh, Ms. Elvira's words. To be able to deal with these issues, I think that uh, who better than a woman who lives in the territories uh, to be able to you know, talk about this, to spearhead this movement. We can't overlook your voices and your sensibilities. We have the responsibility of actually doing something for you and to find um, a way to keep the peace in all territories. We are the ones who should be able to coordinate for you. Now, Around uh, my reflections for this investigation, I should say that this report has been truly enlightening uh, regarding um, what Christina said at the beginning. We do hope that this report will be an input for the work that we do for a better provision for security and a better peacekeeping. These report and its recommendations will serve as a baseline for our peacekeeping uh, construction model in the territories, which uh, includes these uh, focuses, gender, human rights, uh, environmental peace, governance, for us, this will be the basis for the work that we do, so that during the second semester of this year, we're able to implement the activities. Now, um, regarding the recommendations, um, we do understand the importance of um, fine-tuning them to our contexts and uh, the, the recommendations and this report are part of the solution. So we can work together with the government, with international communities and the civil society to truly understand how each one can bring in something to the table to strengthen the actions that truly support I, um, the safety to gender, to climate safety and uh, to the land ownership by women. The recommendations uh, for the national police uh, start by strengthening gender education, environmental education as well. This need for education is a reality. Not only have we identified this need, uh, we were also able to see it uh, through the uh, gender self-evaluation that we've been working with DCAF. 
with this institution, we've been doing very important um, products for the development of uh, gender-based issues, and it should now be uh, adapted to the context of every territory. So this is a big, strong point, I think. That's where we'll find the idea and the possibility to put the recommendations into practice, really. Another recommendation is around improving the levels of confidence from the community. Well, there is nothing more important to us, uh, specifically during a point where our national police is going through institutional transformation. We want to close gaps, really, and to create better uh, safety and confidence link with our communities. The investigation is so thorough, and it lets us know that there are two main aspects that we should follow to build that trust and that confidence. Uh, the first thing is that we should be able to ensure that more police officers are able to reach the furthermost areas, and uh, that uh, they should be there to provide uh, for a better safety for the communities, and uh, to monitor that there is not an inequitable access to land for all of these communities. Those are part of our commitments. We will undergo them and it will depend on the capacities that the Colombian state has to strengthen the national police for us to be able to reach those goals. And we also have the responsibility to work to build work lines from within the territories with our installed capacities. At the very least, that's a start. We should install capacities to ensure that uh, there is more access uh, to women. Another recommendation is around improving the coordination between the police and the National Army. That is a very real and true recommendation, you know. Everyone who has spoken before me, including Dr. Natalia, um, Abigail, Linda, they've all spoken about a very key word. Uh, um, the key word in this webinar, really, which is around, you know, um, the work being multi-sectoral, uh, about synergies, about the coordination that we should all have. I think that's absolutely key. All entities working in the territory should be working together. And uh, this doesn't only go for the national police, but also the army as well, the military. Together, we should truly coordinate so we can uh, approach the territories and do a better work there and uh, deal with the organized um, armed groups, with the regional groups, uh, with illicit crops, with uh, mitigation to disasters, and with everything else that the disaster should be providing for in a unified way. That is a way in which our response can be more effective. We will have a better penetration into the territories and help the communities identify the role that each institution has and what we can do for them. So we have to work more articulately and everybody should work vehemently from their own positions. We must truly work in what our responsibilities entail. So I think synergies are what will truly help us better develop our capabilities and jointly we can bring better solutions to our end beneficiaries. Also, as part of the recommendations, uh, we should uh, improve the capabilities of the UDIPEP in our rural areas. That is very true, Dr. Linda. Those efforts for peace consolidation in the territories should um, work better. Carabineros have been deployed in various areas of the country, but, uh, you know, they're on um, the, uh, they've been deployed to the usual territorial spaces. And there are populations that don't, that aren't yet served by the forces that we deployed. There are many people in the country and over 80% of the populations in the furthermost territories uh, perceive absolutely no uh, presence for us. So it's important for us to strengthen, to reinforce the capabilities of the carabineros and the national police who are able to penetrate more territory and truly offer a service to the people even in the most remotest communities. So we must strengthen our relationship with the communities, with the women, with the farmers in these communities. And finally, uh, another recommendation given us was to improve the access to information. 
yes, that is very important, extremely pertinent, I should say, access to local databases, for instance, uh, to the data garnered by each institution in each of the territories around climate matters. So we're able to truly map and understand the climate risks around all of the issues that we respond to, including gender-based issues. So I just really want to thank Christina and all of our work team, because together you're going to help us build our capabilities from within the territories. Let's uh, stop thinking about the central units, about the large cities, and let's focus on the small units in our territory so that together we can truly make a work plan that will allow us to not, you know, do our own input but to allow the communities to bring their own inputs and to take ownership of their own uh, fates we cannot extricate the impact that environmental safety has on every issue in all of our communities be it a public or a citizen uh, safety uh, issue everything we do must happen articulately I would like to um, invite you all, Dr. Lucas, Ms. Elvira, to participate with us from each of your particular capabilities um, to help us uh, with our academic production, with our academic output. Investigations like this one will form part of our baseline, the basis of our work, so we can stop uh, gender-based violence, so we can stop uh, the illicit crops, so we can better help our peace-building processes, so we can better monitor social protests, etc. So these are my reflections about the recommendations given. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel. For your words, um, I think there's a key thing that you said. Things have to be built from the territories themselves. This is extremely important in Colombia. We have to see the territories as the starting point uh, to be able to create not only a database, but to truly build a vision and an understanding of what's happening. Uh, we can't do it from outside the territories. The stories, the tales that are a part of these studies is also very important. Another important thing is the state presence in the territories for the institutions to actually be there. That has been a challenge within the Colombian context. But you also mentioned that another important thing is for there to be coordination between the military forces and the police in the security sector. I think that's extremely important, especially in the areas that are affected by the conflict. And there are still many issues there that have yet to be discussed. But thank you very much for your ideas, Colonel. Now, I would like us to hear from Superintendent Carlos Pedrosa Mosquera from the Putumayo. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your invitation to um, address you today. I'd like to greet you from um, Colonel Marin Pedraita from the uh, Police Department of Putomayo. Now, regarding uh, my participation for this day, I'd like to start by thanking you for the publication of this document, uh, which is very reflective of what our territories are going through in regards to women and uh, the climate change. For us to be able to keep working in the territory, in the department of Putomayo specifically, these recommendations will help us out very much. Now, the National Police has been working in gender training workshops. Uh, we've received many of these, and we are making many of these as well to other institutions and to other units uh, so we can improve our approach with the community in the Department of Putumayo. Likewise, with the institutions, we've been working together with the army, with uh, the Ministry of Governance and with other stakeholders to do a more articulated work in our approach to the, the, to the communities, in how we work with them, in how we train them, and in how we can help prevent certain crime that happen around environmental issues. 
Um, it is widely understood that in the department of Putumayo there are certain um, problems between uh, the um, government forces and the indigenous communities, and maybe that is due to the different issues with public order that have happened for many years historically. We have done much work around this. We have done much prevention and education activities with our communities to, st to stymie that, but we do have to improve. And uh, that is why we request you and all of the indigenous communities uh, uh, joining in to please allow us to enter your territories because many times uh, we do understand that you may feel that uh, some certain threat from us or certain retaliation from our behalf but our departments are being trained and the directorate for carabineros and rural security in conjunction with the national army what we're doing is trying to prevent um environmental crimes to avoid illegal uh, crops or illegal mining or illegal settlements in uh, the Amazon, also contamination and the protection for human rights. So that's what we're there for. Uh, likewise, I want to give you some context around the situation. The National Colombian Police together with the Ecological Environmental Protection Group, we tend to accompany the environmental authorities when we go into your territories. We don't make any decisions directly together with the environmental authority, with the Ministry of Governance and with the municipalities. We do hold the different controls in the territories to avoid any environmental crimes therein. The National Police um, helps out uh, in uh, the uh, Department of Putomayo, and uh, we are always available here to make uh, education campaigns, uh, dissemination campaigns, uh, so boys and girls and women and uh, all sorts of population, the elderly too, so everyone can have access to environmental education. That is what we're currently working on. Now, regarding the capacity of our personnel, our institution has done many efforts with the purpose of ensuring that our environmental groups in the direction of Carabineros and rural security have a wider capacity, both technological um, and as well as human, so we can do a better work around these territories. And we are working, all of us together, in rural sectors to try to be complementary to this education and the accompanying work, accompaniment work that is done there with the communities. Now, um, once again, I would like to express my thanks for all of the work and all of the support giving us. I come from a Afro-descendant community here in Colombia, and I work very closely with indigenous communities. And that is why I love working in environmental affairs so much, because it is an area where there is armed conflict, but where I can help in. I come from the department of Chocoque, for instance, which is a zone of armed conflict in our country. So I know this kind of violence firsthand, and I know firsthand the consequences that we've lived through due to climate change. I know what are the consequences of terrorism, the consequences of uh, deforestation, of illegal mining, and that is why I'm so involved in this fight. And I am a happy participant and I am fully committed with working with all of the uh, units in the Department of Putomayo so we can truly create alternatives to improve our ecosystems, alternatives to uh, avoid illegal mining or deforestation, and to ensure that our lands keep fertile, to ensure that everyone can return to their own territories and find that they have access to education and information there. So that's what we're doing on behalf of the environmental police. Thank you so much for having us here. Uh, thank you, sir, for your intervention. Um, I think that you understand what Elvira says very well. Um, I believe that uh, the approach that you have with the communities and uh, the emphasis on environmental education to disseminating how, uh, these points around the community is very important. So I believe that there is a lot of openness from the police in the Putomayo. 
the work done with entities and with international organizations, as well as economic and financial entities, is paramount. This, I think, is also a complicated work, but a very important one for us to monitor by setting up the basis, by setting up entry points, and uh, that way we can truly have a dialogue with the communities and understand the context better. So thank you very much for that, Superintendent Petrosa. Now I would like us to hear from Lucas Rudinger from Edelfim. He's going to uh, make some reflections about um, uh, about this report. So, Lucas, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you, first of all, for the invitation and the possibility to comment on the study. Um, maybe before I start, um, I'm not an expert on Colombia, um, but I have been working quite extensively on the links between climate change and security. And I will try to complement um, what was said a bit with experiences from beyond Colombia and the really emerging body of evidence um, on how to address climate and environment related security risks. Um, um, and first of all, I would like to compliment you on, on the study. It's, um, it's really a great work. It's also a really important contribution, I feel, to advance kind of the studying of climate and environment related security risks and what to do about it. Um, and that brings me also to the first comment. Um, I think the study really shows clearly that climate change and security risks are increasingly converging, but also interacting. And what we are seeing in Colombia um, is not just in Colombia, but we can see it also in many other parts of the world is that climate change is increasingly exacerbating certain drivers of conflict. And at the same time, conflict is exacerbating environmental degradation and climate change. Um, and we did a report um, a while ago with the WWF and the Fondacion Palapaz on the links between climate change and conflict in the Colombian Amazon. And we could observe many of the same things that, um, and dynamics that were described in the study. So the climate change and environment destruction are impacting local livelihoods, um, that they're driving human insecurity, and that they are creating really a favorable environment for illegal armed groups. Um, and at the same time, those illegal armed groups and illegal economic activities are driving deforestation um, and the killing of environmental defenders and community activists. And as we know, deforestation, um, on the other hand, is an important driver of global climate change. So we're seeing this um, interaction between climate change and conflict that goes in both directions. Um, and also, and that brings me to my second comment, is that the study clearly shows the relevance of the links between climate change and security for the security sector. And of course, um, one thing has to be said that the security sector is not the only or the main actor um, that needs to respond to these links between climate change and security, but it can play a very, very important role. And we can see that around the world that the security sector is trying to better address climate and environment related security risks. So on the military side, um, NATO just announced that they're establishing a climate security center. Um, we can see that UN peace operations around the world have been really trying hard to address climate and environmental related security risks on the ground. Um, and that police forces also around the world, especially through environmental crime links, are trying to grapple with that issue. Um, and I think that the experiences around that show us two things. Um, one is that it's really important to clearly define what the specific role of the security sector is. Um, and that's important to know what the security sector can actually do, but also important to show that um, these efforts are not trying to securitize climate and environmental action, but mm -hmm. complement and contribute to it. And it's also important to prevent uh, or to make sure that the security sector and their actions are gender responsive, climate and conflict sensitive, so they don't exacerbate existing risks. And I think the study is really a great contribution to both of these things with very, very practical recommendations. And, and that brings me to my second part is kind of reflecting a bit on how to implement that. And I think that the speakers before me did a great job on um, kind of giving very specific answers to those recommendations. But I'll reflect a bit more on um, from experiences beyond Colombia um, on how to best do this kind of integrated approaches that, um, that can create synergies. And um, what we really see is that the first important step is um, to have a very granular 
and localized context analysis that looks both at climate change and conflict. And I think that's exactly what the study has done. Um, and also one of the lessons learned that we've been seeing is this really important focus on the most marginalized and excluded. And this study did really a great job at um, providing, for example, safe spaces, specific dialogue formats, and also very practical things such as um, the use of visual materials um, to make sure that people who normally are not part of these kind of conversations and analysis um, could bring their voice um, to the table. And I think that's as much as a contribution as, as the indicators, which are also very, very great. And I'll, I'll compliment you on that. Um, maybe also just um, quickly, there are now um, um, the first guidance documents and frameworks available for this kind of analysis. Um, and I'll maybe share um, one in a second, um, one that we've been working on, um, which is uh, called um, Weathering Risk. Um, um, and that can give, give you some kind of guidance and help if you want to do those kind of assessments by yourself. Um, the second um, important point is if you want to do these kind of um, integrated actions is that you bring in different expertise, that you bring in climate and environment experts, that you bring in security experts, as well as gender and social inclusion experts. And if you bring those kind of groups together, um, you can um, you can identify these kind of synergies um, mm -hmm. and kind of create action across silos. And then lastly, um, and that brings me a bit to the role, it's really important to identify very concrete entry points and topics around which this integration can happen. And from kind of existing um, experiences, there are a couple of entry points that are particularly relevant for the security sector. And the first one is addressing, of course, environmental crimes um, and um, supporting the protection of environmental defenders and community activists, especially from indigenous communities and women. Um, then supporting disaster risk management and adaptation, but also to use these kind of actions in these areas to build peace and to rebuild and build relationships um, between communities and um, the security sector um, that often has, um, as we heard today, also suffered under um, um, conflict. Um, and the study mentions, for example, the positive um, perception of the military in some communities because of the role in disaster response. So that really shows you the, the opportunities here. Um, and then um, another entry point is to really address tensions and conflicts around natural resources, um, in particular land, water, and forests. And here again, it's really important to put a focus on marginalization and inclusion. So inclusion in decision-making processes around natural resources management. And then another point that was mentioned already before, kind of addressing issues around land ownership for women, for example. And then the last point, um, and then I'll stop, is that no matter what the entry point is, um, if you work on climate or environment-related security risk, it's key to put a focus on two cross-cutting issues. And one is exclusion and marginalization. So making sure that your approaches are inclusive, as inclusive as possible, and then addressing weak governance and corruption, which is in itself, of course, a driver of kind of fragility and insecurity, but it's also very important to rebuilding um, trust between um, communities and the state. And with that, I would like to hand it um, back over to you. Thank you. So, Lucas, uh, muchas gracias por, por estos comentarios. Lucas, thank you very much for these comments. Uh, they're quite enriching. I think that the issue here is inclusion. The most vulnerable populations must be included, and this should be one of the most important entry points. Inclusion is of the essence for governance. It should be a central point. And like Linda was also saying, this is an area where we should include a different knowledge, different branches of knowledge. And we should have not only, like you said, Luca, experts in um, human rights, but also in, um, in climate, in gender, and many other areas. That is what leads us at GCAV, for instance, to do these kind of studies and also to see what are the specific and concrete entry points in each of the areas where we work so we can develop those and so we can have a better landed discussion with our stakeholders. That way we can lead the discussion to areas that seem clearer 
to our partners and which can help them understand the coordination mechanisms that must be enacted. Um, this is an important topic, not only for the security sector, but also for the uh, climate sector and the relationship with the communities. So we should focus on that. Now, I have some questions here that we've gotten from the group. We are about to finish with this session, so let's see these questions. The following the question is for Elvira. One of the participants uh, joining us today, I don't know where from, but they're asking, what is the perspective of the indigenous and rural communities around the development projects designed by the Colombian government to improve the human security of their communities? So, Elvira, would you be able to answer that question for us, please? Certainly. I believe that question was made by Danielita, right? Well, just to let you know, one of our expectations with the government projects that we get in our communities is that even though it doesn't always happen, we expect that the projects truly consider uh, involvement from the communities and ownership thereof. In the territories, uh, they should investigate what we indigenous women want, what farmers and what uh, female leaders in the territory want to be done. Maybe we should be asked before the actions are taken. We here, living here, should not only be considered, but also we should be brought in as co-authors of any project that the government decides. Um, there are many times that external stakeholders come in with projects of their own and they say this is what's going to solve your lives. But that's not it. We at the communities know what we want, so we should get what we want. We want to rescue our naked seed. We want to rescue our Mother Earth. Uh, we know what our legislation needs uh, and it is important for projects to take that into consideration. Many projects, for instance, bring in seeds that are not native to our land or they bring seeds that have GMOs or chemicals that will affect our land and maybe they don't know this. Uh, so why not ask us first? Now, regarding safety, we have our own safety. And uh, as female leaders in our territory, we don't maybe need the government to send us a uniformed officer or they, sell, or, or they send us a phone to be in contact with us. But maybe what would be best for us is the security, the support to our own security. We have set up some of our own security in the rural area, so maybe legitimizing that could help us out. We have our own guard, for instance, so we don't need vests, we don't need phones. Uh, I mean, what are, what are we going to use phones for? I mean, we don't really need to communicate externally that much with our phones. So that's my answer to your question, really. Everything should happen with the basis from the territory stakeholders. Perfect. That's a very interesting comment. The design of the project should include the indigenous communities in their authorship. In that way, their needs will truly be reflected in their actions. So thank you for that, Elvira. I have another question here, which is aimed at Colonel Alexander. Um, Colonel, which coordination mechanisms already exist in the security sector? Meaning, what are the mechanisms that are already in place? And which ones work with civil society mechanisms like the um, anti-deforestation work tables, for instance? Uh, maybe that's you, Colonel, or maybe Superintendent Pedrosa. Maybe either of you can answer that question. Uh, would you like to start, Pedrosa, or do I? Yes, I would like to start, Colonel, with your authorization, of course. Uh, good morning once again. 
So the kind of coordination that's already been done in the Putumayo territory is the organization of a work table, which we call the Burbuja Ambiental or the environmental uh, bubble, really. This is a work table that's made up by the government agencies, by the municipality uh, leaders, by the uh, town hall, by the uh, local leaders, and by all of our agencies. We all meet and sit together to uh, draft the kind of action that are going to be undertaken in the Department of Putomayo. And most of our actions are aimed against deforestation and illegal mining. In Putumayo, we don't have that much experience around environmental crimes or around prosecuting them, really. But we do have a, a certain a work where we've been able to avoid contamination. So that's what we do in Putumayo. We sit down with the Burbuja Ambiental work table at least twice every month, and uh, we uh, present on the work that each of our agencies have been doing. Perfect. That sounds amazing. I would also like to um, delve further into the idea of dialogue with the communities and truly including them into the work that you do. How could you establish a a, a, a more concrete or a better coordinated dialogue uh, with the uh, local communities and your work tables uh, to be able to face the climate crisis. Um, could you comment on that maybe? Certainly, if I may. Yes, Colonel, of course. Yes, but <laughs> yes, Petros, if you would like to, I'm going to take that part of the question. Oh, yes, I'm sorry if I interrupted you. But um, I could tell you that at the municipal level, there are many meetings that we hold with the uh, local uh, stakeholders, and they have a gender office which communicates with the offices of municipal planning. They do so to uh, broaden uh, the kind of information that is disseminated to the communities, uh, letting them know about the projects and the activities that are upcoming uh, or that are being planned, and about the areas upon which we will focus physically in the territory. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Superintendent uh, Colonel. Uh, you were saying? Sure. Uh, in regard to the first question, which is about the interinstitutional articulation, I would just like to let you know, for those of you who don't know this, uh, the National Police currently has three units that answer to environmental safety. First, there's the Directorate of Carabineros and Rural Security. Among its structure, there's the area of environmental security and national resources. This unit's objective is to protect all the natural assets, the water, the biodiversity, and the environment. How do they go about this? By supporting the environmental local authorities, like Superintendent Pedrosa said, in the defense of the strategic assets of the nation around everything that biodiversity concerns. They do so by establishing interinstitutional partnerships academically, scientifically, and politically for the preservation of the natural resources. And they also coordinate and spearhead uh, programs and strategic um, actions around awareness raising and protection of the na of the national assets then there's also the bureau for protection and special services this is a, a unit that has a special environmental and ecological project in charge of monitoring the natural resources, the water quality, and the public order around areas at risk. This unit seeks to uh, prevent and control any factor that could be a detriment to the environment. How do they go about this? They do so by police procedures for the seizure of, um, illegal, tra of, of illegal trafficking of flora and fauna, and they exert prevention, control, and surveillance of the exploitation and commercialization of plants and animals and the illegal trafficking thereof. 
Now, what they seek mainly um, is to work with the, with the locals in the territories where they supervise this kind of activities. There are always spaces for improvement. I do understand that, um, but we focus on the kind of massive exploitation that's happening illegally in your territories, and I'm stopping that. Um, um, like Elvira said, indigenous uh, peoples can take care of their own environment, and they do so being respectful of their mother earth, and they are able to um, do their own mining in a very eco-friendly way. So we are not concerned with things like that. We're only concerned with those who are responsible of contaminating and decimating the environment illegally or massively. Now, throughout this institutional transformation process, these two, these two areas, these two uh, different units uh, work together to strengthen their own capabilities and to disseminate that strengthening locally. The Carabineros and the rural security will be the um, sole responsible entity to responding to the local authorities. Um, and then there is also the unit of special operations during disasters and emergencies. That's the third one I wanted to mention. That unit is the one in charge of integrating all of the capacities of the National Police Force to complement uh, the operations uh, during any risk or threat. They also look into um, threat detection, risk reduction, and this contributes to the well-being of people and citizen safety in general. How do they go about this? They go about this uh, through our investigation process, through the mitigation and risk reduction uh, projects, and they collaborate uh, with all of the units stationed locally in responses to risk. And they publish the parameters and the guidelines around the prevention in emergencies and disasters and um, they are always updating themselves. They try to answer and help whenever there is a big eco uh, ecosystem problem, and uh, they try to help evacuate uh, the populations and afterwards help them recover some of the land that may have been damaged through the emergency. So these three are the units that the National Police have. Um, now, about the dialogue in the territories, Ms. Christina, I wanted to comment about that. Uh, regrettably, and I have to recognize this during this space, we aren't, we aren't always perceived as a police unit that performs adequately. Uh, it is perceived that the central government doesn't always provide the necessary attention to the local governments in each of the areas. This is regrettable, but um, true. So actions should be um, better focused to improve that. That is what we're looking for, actually. We're looking to go to the territories and firsthand to be able to compile uh, the necessary input to establish better dialogues with the communities, direct dialogues that allow us to understand the dynamics behind everything happening and why things are happening in the territories. That way our performance will be more efficient and more opportune. We always learn about the culture, where we're going into and the kind of attention that they need. And we try to advise our units accordingly. So that could definitely help us provide a better service, a more direct service by attending to the parameters that the national and the local governments dictate. The national police can actually be an axis for articulation that allows to close the gaps and to build better uh, dialogue scenarios. 
Perfect. Thank you, Colonel. We are almost about to close, but your comments are very good and they give us interesting clues for us to seek out the dialogues that must be had with the communities to include the territorial perspectives. Now, before we close, I have two final questions. One of them is aimed at Lucas. And then I also have another question coming in from Lima, Peru, aimed at Linda. Let's start with Lucas's question. Um, um, you know, just to get more input from the international community, really, we wonder what would be the recommendations for the international community, Lucas? You uh, know very well you know very well the resonance that this topic has internationally. And there are many people from the international community who are tuning in. So um, we would like to hear that from you. Like, what are your recommendations? Things that would be important for us to include around this. So that's the first question. And then the second question is for Linda. That's a question coming in from Peru. The question is, how are the rights of children and teenagers included in this study? So after Lucas answers, maybe Linda, you can follow with your answer as well. So first of Lucas, thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short um, in terms of time. I think um, if we think about the international community, I'll talk maybe a bit about um, donors and what they can can support um, and how they can support maybe Colombia and the different actors in Colombia. I think um, what we see um, right now is that um, a lot of the international community and donors um, still work in silos. So they provide assistance um, for the security sector and they provide assistance for climate change action and for environmental action, but they don't really provide a lot of funding um, or support mm -hmm. that integrates these. Um, um, these kind of funding um, streams. And I think that is something that international actors have to get better at, um, to either um, define these funding streams broadly enough that they can, um, that they can for example, also um, support integrated um, climate security um, action um, on the ground, um, or to kind of, um, or to provide um, specific funding um, or specific support um, for integrated approaches. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that is one thing. And then I think also for the international community, it's really important to understand that um, addressing these issues, especially in the Colombian Amazon, is a critical part of global climate action. So addressing these issues um, um, is not only important um, at home, so in Europe, for example, but um, really the protection um, of environmental defenders um, addressing illegal mining, illegal um, logging in the Amazon um, is part and needs to be a central part of global climate action. With that, I would hand it over back to you. Thank you very much, Lucas. I think that's very important. And that's another perception of our SADCAV. Funds for, um, you know, issues on climate change come from somewhere, but that intersectionality, that nexus, is something that the international community definitely needs to think about. And that's a great com um, comment on your part, Lucas. And now, in conclusion, let's have Linda answer her question. We're running a bit um, late, but um, we can use your answer as a conclusion to our event. Thank you, Christina, and thank you for that question. In this investigation, which I should be said was done by women for women, we recognize uh, the uh, unity of uh, the experiences of women and the intersection of the different identity markers, which includes age, ethnic group, and uh, well-being spaces. Now, we do not have a particular focus on the rights of um, the youth and uh, adolescents, but there are stories there that do mention uh, boys and girls due to the social roles that women have, even young girls, within their own homes and communities. So we do mention certain security situations that underage uh, people are focused on, but it's not one of the main focuses of our um, project which would actually be a very worthwhile study for us to conduct further on. 
It is also important to mention that there is no true difference between the individual and the community, you know. The communities actually work as a whole. They're very holistic. They don't see themselves as individual, but as a whole together with their resources. So, you know, separating things into, for instance, let's just focus on kids or let's just focus on teenagers. It's not something that we truly did, but it is something that is intertwined into the fabric of the narrative of the community. So while this report doesn't focus specifically on boys, girls, and teenagers, we do include them into the local indicators and the recommendations that we mention, which includes a de-aggregation of the data, not only by sex, but also by age, so we can have a more specific idea about how these changes affect people into age groups. That would be my answer. Thank you for clearing that up, Linda, and for answering the question coming in from Lima, Peru. Now, this brings us to our close. First of all, I would like to extend my deep appreciation to all of the panelists for their excellent participation and for the comments uh, that they have made, which has led us to a very interesting discussion, which obviously should be expanded. Um, I would also like to thank Elvira, Colonel Alexander, Superintendent Pedrosa, and Lucas for your excellent comments. Um, I think that also with the office participation of uh, the uh, different uh, stakeholders so we can get really amazing questions from the participants and this shows that there is much interest in this link between climate change and the security sector from a governance standpoint uh, and from a human security standpoint. I think that we're barely scratching the surface with this discussion. At DCAF, we are very interested in continuing these kind of studies that are an input to a broader international discussion, where it's very obvious that not only for the Latin American and the Caribbean re uh, region, but for the entire world, the Amazon is a key to the well-being. So we're very thankful for your time. There were over a hundred uh, people connected um, online, which only reflects which only reflects the interest worldwide around this. And please stay connected because you're going to get Linda's report, the link to it very soon. So thank you very much, everyone, for your excellent participation, and we hope that you can follow us through our webpage. Um, this document will be available not only in English and in Spanish, but we are going to be publishing it in Portuguese very soon, seeing as there are many other countries like Brazil, for instance, who are very interested in pitching in. So thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Gracias.